Thank you, Cantor Alicia. You guys can sit down now, relax. So, some boundaries, okay? This is a discussion and a teaching on the issue of religious exemptions from mandatory vaccinations. This is not a discussion about the medical uh, beliefs or practices. This is not a discussion about our vaccinations good or bad for you, okay? We leave that to other organizations that are doing that. This is a synagogue. And so our discussion is about religious, specifically religious exemptions from mandatory vaccinations. So those are sort of the boundaries, okay? I wanna kind of put that out there. It is not a place to say, oh, science says, or oh, science says this. This is really important. We need to remember that in Judaism, our behavior is based upon eternal ethics and values, as opposed to science by definition is always changing, okay? 200 years ago, science said very clearly that blacks, gypsies, and other people were not human. The immigration policy of the 1920s in this country was based upon studies that show that Asians are 60% human and Italians are this percentage, et cetera. And we all know what happened across the world um, because Jews weren't considered humans. So this, I wanna make it clear, that's off the table, okay? Um, that's not why we're here. That's not what this is for, all right? Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, a Jewish understanding. Dr. Shannon is going to talk about all sorts of things. I, if those of you who do not know Dr. Shannon, she is the founder of Four United Solutions, Freedom of Religion United Solutions, which is probably the premier advocacy group in the country, right? It's, it's the number one uh, nonprofit organization for religious exemptions in the country. We were founded in 2019 before COVID. So that's, that's uh, we're gonna have a little bit of dialogue about all those things. And then we'll open it up to questions. Um, and to have dialogue about things. Shannon, I'm gonna apologize, I can't talk sitting down. <laughs> go for it. It doesn't <laughs> work for me. It's, do I need to stand up too? That's up to you, I just, you know, if I don't pace, I don't think I can talk. Um, <laughs> that's why Allison is always telling me to sit down. Okay, so, <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about Judaism. First of all, you need to understand in Judaism, two Jews equals three opinions, four synagogues, and five rabbis. And it should be that way. Because if God is infinite, how can any one person define divinity? How can any one person say, this is the way? So our entire Talmud is based on machlochas, on, on the dialogue of, she's just excited. She heard Talmud, she got excited. Um, it's the entire piece, is, our entire Talmud is based on the idea of debate and of argumentation and of understanding that this is all to try and make the world a better place, okay? Before we get into what is, let me talk about what is not a legitimate religious exemption. And again, I can only speak from my view and from a Talmudic view and from, from other things, and there will be other rabbis who will say other things. 
You will constantly hear the phrase pekuak nefesh. Pekuak nefesh means the saving of a soul or the saving of a life. And you'll hear many, many rabbis say, you must take the vaccination because pekuak nefesh, saving a life, is the most important law in Judaism. How many of you have heard that in one way or another? Okay. That's just not accurate. I'm, I'm sorry. Pekuak nefesh is the primary value of Judaism. We are taught very specifically, if you need to break the Sabbath laws in order to save a life, you do so. If you need to break certain laws in order to save a child, you do so. Okay? One of the ways that Jews have been tortured for centuries, and I'll use the Germans, the Nazis as an example, is they would say to the rabbi, urinate on the Torah, or we're going to kill this child, God forbid. Without hesitation, the rabbi would always urinate on the Torah. Because, and this comes from, by the way, the comment that says you shall live by these words of Torah, not die by these words, okay? That's where the stem in Torah comes from. You shall live by Torah, not die by them. But Pekuach Nefesh, first of all, the vast majority of the laws around Pekuach Nefesh are what negative prohibitions you are exempt from, i.e., you are not allowed uh, to eat shrimp. However, if someone says eat shrimp or die, guess what you do? You eat the shrimp, okay? And then you throw it up afterwards. But you eat the shrimp. <laughs> the idea being that we are here to save life. There's only a few things that we, we will not save a life for. One is murder, um, and, and one is adultery, and one is uh, sexual incest, is immoral relations. So the idea of pekuach nefesh is a great logic that saving life is primary. And that's true in Judaism. However, the laws of Pekuach Nefesh as elucidated in the Talmud are extremely specific. They are specific in terms of specific threat against a specific individual. You can only use Pekuach Nefesh as a legal argument if it is a specific threat against a specific individual. You can't use it as a general threat against a general populace. <laughs> Bless you. See, she sneezed on the truth. Um, so the idea being that you really can't use pekuach nefesh to justify vaccinations or to justify not taking a vaccination. If a doctor says the vaccination is going to save your life, that does not mean that you can use pekuach nefesh. Or if a doctor says vaccinations are killing lives, you can't use it that way either. Okay? So the first thing in terms of a Jewish argument is let's take pekuach nefesh off the table. All right? Let's just take it off the table. And when someone decides to say to you, well, you have to take a vaccination because of saving a life, it's just not accurate. Because this is not a specific threat against specific individuals. We don't know who will or who will not get the virus. We do not know who will or will not recover. God willing, everyone does. We do not know who and is, who is, is healed or prevented from the vaccine and who is not. It's just too general to use that argument. Does that make sense to everyone, first of all? And you can talk to me, I can see you, this is not television. Well, I mean, for you guys it is, but for the rest of you it's not, right, okay. So let's just take that off the table, all right? Just right off the table. How many of you ever get a feeling in your stomach, a gut intuition about something? All right. In Judaism, that is God whispering to you, all right? Our intuition is God whispering in our ear, and God doesn't shout, God whispers, okay? And Judaism empowers each person to have their own relationship with God. I am not a priest, okay? I, I am not the conduit for any Jew to God. We don't go through middlemen or agents or lawyers. We go straight to the source, all right? So it's important to understand that if Roger says one thing about an understanding of a piece of Torah and Stan says a different thing, we say elu ve'elu. This means these words and these words are both words of Torah. Okay, we respect the opposing opinion. That's why throughout the Talmud, the, the court will make a decision in favor of, Roger, of Rabbi Roger or Rabbi Stan, but they will present the minority opinion as well. And there's a lot of dialogue about this, uh, about how important this is, and how when we don't respect each other's opinion, it causes a great challenge. And there's a, a great piece about uh, the dialogue between two great Talmudic sages, Rachel Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan, and how when they don't have respect, the horrible things that happen, when they don't have respect for each other. For us, someone who disagrees with us is not evil, they are wrong. Okay, and we argue. And we are open to the fact that they could be right. 
because these words and these words are all words of Torah. So we all have our individual insights that come to us from God. And sometimes it's just a voice in our head, sometimes it comes from meditation, sometimes it comes just as an intuitive feeling, right? You meet, Roger met Rita and he said, I better marry that woman. Okay, right Roger? There you go, good answer. <laughs> so we respect that. Additionally, Judaism gives great strength as a foundation of Judaism to this concept of free will. In the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says that God says, I place before you life and death blessing and curse, choose life. Later on, Rambam, Maimonides, the great sage, in his Echot Shuvah, in his Laws of Redemption, uh, 5, 1 and 5, 2, he specifically says we have free will and it's up to us if we choose to be like Moses or like Arasha, someone who's not good, all right? So free will is of paramount importance. Based upon that, and I, and I want to be clear, I'm vaccinated. My wife is vaccinated. Okay? That's I, our choice. And I'm not. And she's not. And we love each other anyhow. Right? Right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the point being that to respect someone else's free will. It's really, really important that we do that. This is one of the major pieces. And as such, if someone is looking to understand a Jewish theological argument to not get vaccinated, the simple fact that you have discerned with God that you have a sincerely held religious belief that God doesn't want you to vaccinate right now, from a Jewish perspective, I want to empower that. Everyone follow that argument first of all. That is the strong argument because Judaism is not based on a hierarchical system like the Pope is or different traditions are. Ours is based on dialogue and on free will. So the first argument that really is a very strong argument is if your intuition says that God is telling you not to get vaccinated, then as a rabbi, I want to empower that. Okay, because that's Jewish the theology. So that's the first reason that on a theological basis that anyone who says, you know what, I've kind of thought about this and felt about it and meditated on it and prayed on it and discerned about it or whatever your term may be and I don't think God wants me taking the vaccine right now. That is a legitimate Jewish reason. And as a rabbi, as a Jew, I have an obligation to say that's your sincerely held religious belief. And I want to just toss in something before we go farther. The key phrase in getting a religious exemption is sincerely held religious belief. Constitutional law is extremely clear. If you believe, and this is a, almost a direct quote from Robert Tyler from the Advocates of Faith and Freedom, who's one of the premier religious rights attorneys in the nation. If you believe that a cloud is God and the cloud tells you don't vaccinate, and that's your sincerely held religious belief, that is enough constitutionally to get a religious exemption. Doesn't matter what Joe Biden or Amgem or Disney or Nike or anybody else says. If that is your sincerely held religious belief, that is the constitutional foundation of it. Okay, it goes back to the Establishment Clause, goes back to all sorts of things in our Constitution. But theologically, one of our pieces is we have to empower free will. Another reason, Jewishly, that you may be exempt from vaccination um, and, and is a man comes to me and he says, and, and, and raise your hand if you're here. Um, he says, I'm an LAPD officer. Are there any LAPD officers here? Okay, so he's not here. A uh, man comes to me and says, I'm an LAPD officer. I don't really care about the vaccine, taking it or not taking it. My wife is a pharmacist and she doesn't want me taking it. She's seen too many drugs 20 years later being recalled. So much so that she really doesn't want to and, and would even think potentially about a divorce. Is there a Jewish answer on this? There is, it's called Shalom Bayat, it means peace in the house. Peace in the house is of primary importance for us. Okay, and he had a valid point, he said, you know, my wife wouldn't get a breast augmentation without talking to me about it. I wouldn't get a vasectomy without talking with her about it, without us both being on board, right? And I don't feel like I, I can do that, he said. Well, we have that lesson from the very beginning of the Torah in the book of Genesis. So God says to Adam, don't eat the fruit. How many of you have heard that story? It was not an apple. There are no apples in the Middle East. 
it was pomegranate or a fig. It's, it was not, I don't care, it was not, it's pictures of him eating an apple. It's like, there are no apples. <laughs> so, I, there was some say it was natural, some say it was a pomegranate, some say it was a fig. But God says to Adam, don't eat the fruit, and then Eve eats the fruit. And then Adam eats it. The great Adam, the founder of all of humanity, eats it. And from this, we learn this concept of Shalom Bayat, that even though God specifically said to Adam, don't eat it, in order to make his wife and have peace in the house, to make her happy, he defied the very word of God. Well, if we're going to defy the word of God, and I said this to the officer, if you're going to defy the word of God, if Adam did that, um, how much easier is, it, easier is it to defy the word of whatever organization wants to mandate that you take the vaccine. So if your spouse, you know, think about this for a minute, if it would cause potentially divorce, that's a real problem, isn't it? So if you want to do a religious vaccination from a Jew, or a religious exemption, excuse me, from a Jewish perspective, when people call me, which Dr. Shannon has been sending lots of people my email and phone number, <laughs> um, which I thank you so much for uh, every time. And, uh, you're saving so, humanity. Uh, yeah, one person. You know, we believe if, if you help one soul, you've saved humanity. That's mm -hmm. Jewish thought. So if someone, um, someone calls and they say, what do I do? This is the process that I will tell them. Number one, let's talk about it. Why is it that you don't want to have this vaccination? And when they get to the place that their gut, their discernment, their prayer, their listening to God says, I don't think God wants me to have it. Whatever their viewing perspective of God is, doesn't really matter. So we, we're clear it's their deeply held spiritual belief, their deeply held religious belief. I then say, okay, I want you to go to a website called forunitedsolutions.org. F-O-R, for freedom of religion, unitedsolutions.org, where you will find all sorts of resources, including affidavits, and, and, and Dr. Shannon will talk about that in a few minutes. And I want you to download the appropriate affidavit, sign it, fill it out, sign it, get it notarized. Say, okay, then, I, well, then we're going to have a discussion. I want you to know, tell me who it needs to go to. You know, who is this going to, or is it just a general letter? And I'll write a letter talking about the fact that Judaism is not monolithic and that Mr. Poloni's values, that Mr. Poloni's deeply held, sincerely held religious beliefs are that he should not take the vaccination at this time and that that is backed up in Jewish theology by our empowerment of free will, that he has the free will to make that decision and we have to allow him that free will based on Maimonides, et cetera. And so I will send the letter I'll, and I send that to them. So now they have the document from Four United Solutions. They have a letter from me and then they write their own letter and the real, again, the, the key words are, I believe it is, it is my sincerely held religious belief not to take the vaccine at this time. And that that little packet of those three documents is what you present. And before we get into other, a few other things, you need to understand something. And, I, and, and we need to be honest. Most organizations will tell you to go pound sand. They will tell you, no, we're not accepting this. They will use whatever excuse. The best one I actually heard that these people have set themselves up for a huge lawsuit, and they're going to have one, um, is they'd given religious exemption to some Christian donors and then these, they actually said to this family that we don't think Judaism says that, and so we're not giving you exemption. So they've now opened themselves to a whole other lawsuit. If you do this and you are rejected, you need to know where the line in the sand is for yourself, okay? Because when you are told no, which is probably going to happen, especially if you're in California, you need to know what will you do. There are more and more attorneys who are coming out and starting to represent these cases for litigation. There are more and more opportunities for that. But lawsuits are costly with time, energy, as well as can be money. Okay? The advocates for faith and freedom at this point are only taking cases that are stepping stones to be able to argue before the Supreme Court. So you need, the caveat is you need to understand it is not going to be an easy journey for you. You also need to understand, don't quit. If your job tells you you're going to be fired on November 1st unless you're vaccinated. Do not quit on October 31st. Let them fire you on November 2nd. Because if you quit on October 31st, you now have limited your damages. You chose to withdraw, you chose to quit. Let them 
come after you. Okay, because then you have a whole labor dispute as well. See, she agrees. Um, she's auditioning for dancing. So uh, that's really, really important to understand. Do not give up until they tell you you're out. And then you need to decide, do you want to have that, that lawsuit, whether it's about labor, education, or whatever else, or do you not? My suspicion and the suspicion of most attorneys that I've spoken with um, is that, and, and doctor, tell me if you've heard anyone say differently of the, of the legal counsel you know. My suspicion and, and most of the people, in fact, all the people I've talked with, is that eventually you will win your lawsuit. There will be a settlement. Okay? But it's going to take time, effort, energy, and money. And that's probably the people you've talked to have said the same thing, haven't they, pretty much? Well, the thing is, is that when they deny your religious exemption, it's going against uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act because businesses cannot discriminate against you for your religious beliefs. So it's, it's kind of clear. Now, that doesn't take away the fight, but I want to relay something so you understand. 15 months ago, 18 months ago, Gavin Newsom decided to say that churches and synagogues were going to be closed and a few places, uh, many, most places closed and some did not. We have never closed our doors, not one day, not one service. We didn't close our doors for the Inquisition or the Nazis, and Newsom can kiss my tuchus. So, um, we're just not gonna, when we stream for anyone, so you don't have to feel compelled, you can stream it. For everything we do, we stream as well, or most things, certainly close services and classes and stuff. So, he made that, that statement. There were a number of churches who stayed open that he tried to make examples of, and they were shut down and they filed suit. And guess what? They're getting checks. There was a church recently, I think it's in Orange County, they got an $800,000 check from the state of California. Settlement, didn't have to go to suit because they'd filed suit, they'd gone down the process, that was the settlement. Because there is no constitutional argument that they can pull out and say, you have to, you have to do this, you have to do this, and discriminate against religious belief, okay? It's going to probably be the same with regard to religious exemptions from vaccinations, but you need to understand that during that process, it will not be easy. You will be ostracized by your friends and sometimes family. You will be ostracized by your coworkers. You will be forced to, if you're going into legal suit, you'll be forced to spend time, energy, money, and it's a journey. And I will never recommend to anyone whether you should or should not take a fight um, I can only speak for myself and, and, and what I believe. So understand that going in, that it's going to be a journey if you apply for a, you tell them you want an exemption and they reject it. All right, that's really important. Don't go in there uh, in a Pollyannic attitude saying, oh, okay, they're gonna say yes. Oh, they said no, that's okay. I'm just gonna file a suit and it's gonna be over in a week. It's not. But I want you, I want you to all think about an idea. How many of you don't raise your hands, just answer inside yourself. How many of you, for whatever reason, don't believe it's a good idea to take this vaccination at this time? Now the question that I ask you is, how would you feel if you did, and the next day it was clear that the law was struck, there's no law, that it was struck, and that you could have been exempt and not taken it? Or for those of us with children, the school puts pressure on you and so you end up vaccinating your 10, 12, 14 year old child because you want them to get an education. It's not worth the fight. And then a week after you vaccinate, it's struck down and you realize had you waited one more day, one more week, one more month, your child would not have had to have that vaccination. And how would you feel? Okay. I want to be clear, my personal recommendation, if you're healthy, you want to, take the vaccination, okay? I am extremely hesitant with children because it's an RNA vaccination. It is children, we don't know what's gonna happen with puberty. If someone said to me, forget about COVID, here's a vaccine for the common cold, your child will never get a cold, I would say that's great, let me know in 20 years how it's affected fertility. Because I would like someday, God willing, to be a grandpa. I think it'd be a good grandpa. Stan, you didn't have to say you look like one now. So, <laughs> so realize, please, when you walk into this, it must be your sincerely held religious belief. Don't, don't fake it. Don't use that as an excuse, please. Because when you do, 
it bastardizes the whole thing for everybody. Please, if it is your sincerely held religious belief and that does not mean God has come and talked to you, it could be just an intuition, then you can go through this process, realize what the challenges will be afterward and during. Many people have been ostracized from their family and friends. Realize that there may be challenges of going to dinner or the theater or anything else, and that these are some of the challenges that will happen. But if we don't fight them now, when would we? Rabbi Hillel says, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? So it's something each individual really needs to think about. But this is the process. Please be aware of the caveats involved if you go through this process. Um, look, because we've kept our doors open, I've gotten hate mail, threats, and my house is vandalized. Okay? So there's a lot of fear which translates, they're so scared, they have become hate-filled or angry. And um, it's important that we remember that relationships are really important and a priority. So I hope that help, helps at least from a Jewish standpoint. Again, the logic of Shalom Bayit is a good logic if your spouse really doesn't want you to do it. Because how, how is it fair that the government should get in the middle? And the issue of free will is of, of, of paramount uh, importance in this process. Um, the one other thing I do want to point out to everyone, how many of you think it is the law in the state of California that you cannot smoke in a restaurant? Law comes from legislature. Laws must come from the legislature. That is guaranteed in our constitution. That's why we have three branches of government. And the president can get up there, whoever the president is, and says, my mandate, or the governor, my mandate is, and you can feel free again to tell him to kiss in your tochas, because mandates are not laws. Laws are passed by legislature. Please remember that any attorney you meet with will tell you that as well. And that's on our side if you do want to have exemption. So we'll come back to some other questions, but that, does that help a little bit with putting a Jewish foundation on this? Please do not use Pekuach Nefesh to justify taking it or not taking it. If someone tells you, well, you've got to save a life and that's the most important thing, well, you know, that's not what Pekuach Nefesh is. Talmud is very, very specific, <coughs> and it must be a, a specific threat against a specific individual at a specific time. It's not just sort of this vague, ambiguous thing. So hopefully that helps a little bit for a Jewish perspective. We'll talk a little bit more. Doctor, I'm going to sit down now. Okay. <laughs> You've said like everything that I need to say, though. <laughs> well, here you want my yarmulke? <laughs> um, Keep what would you? you? Well, so, talk about your organization. Now okay, so on. my organization. So I'm from California, and California has the strictest vaccine laws in the nation. In 2015, they uh, California took away our religious exemption and our personal belief exemption. And um, let me actually go back a little bit before that. I've been working with kids uh, with developmental disabilities um, and learning disabilities since 2001. And so I've seen vaccine injury firsthand many, many, many times. Um, and so I was working with you know kids with autism, kids with severe ADHD, and uh, throughout that time, I would always say to the parents, you know. Um, what, caused, what do you believe caused this autism? And I would hear the same story over and over again. And this is in my early 20s when, you know, I didn't really know, I didn't have kids of my own, I didn't know what autism was, and they would tell me that their child was fine. And, um, you know, after a series of vaccines, something happened. A light went off inside of them, and they stopped speaking, or they start, you know, banging their head, or um, couldn't pay attention. And so I heard, kept hearing that story, which made me really look into vaccines and vaccine injury. Um, and I, at the time, thought that it was really more of the vaccine schedule. So our, right now, our current vaccine schedule, COVID aside, um, when I was a kid, I got maybe like nine shots. Today, by the time a child turns 18, it's 72. Add in... Um, the COVID vaccine, which was just approved yesterday for five-year-olds, um, 
and you know all of the boosters, we're looking at maybe 75 shots, maybe up to 80 as time goes on. And so, um, and so I really became aware of vaccine injury early on. And uh, then in 2009, I wasn't completely against vaccines. I thought I just needed to do maybe one at a time. And um, in 2009, I was personally pressured to get the flu shot while I was pregnant with my first son. And uh, within a day, it caused, I had a very severe reaction to the flu shot, which caused my, I was only 12 weeks pregnant. It caused um, me to leak amniotic fluid and I almost lost the baby. And it's a very long story, so I won't get into it. Thankfully, he's good and he's 11 years old today. Thank but, um, you know, when he was born, I was very reluctant to vaccinate. And so, you know, by 2015, when that came around and uh, we had a bill called SB 277, and when that passed, we lost our religious exemptions. We lost our personal belief exemptions. And I had been fighting that Should bill. That was state, correct? Not that was California. Um, and so I had been fighting that bill going up to Sacramento, uh, meeting with every California legislator, legislator I could. And, um, and then, so what happened is because California lost their religious exemptions and their personal belief exemptions, a lot of people went to uh, turn towards medical exemptions because it was the only way that they could opt out of vaccination for their kids. And this is means like, even if it was just one vaccine that you didn't want, for instance, let's say you didn't want your child to get the hepatitis B vaccine because that's a sexually transmitted disease or a drug user's disease. Um, if you wanted to opt out of that one vaccine, then that your child could not go to school. And so um, a lot of people turn to medical exemptions and um, unfortunately medical exemptions in California were taken away in 2019 with a bill called SB 276. And then I was fighting that bill as well up in Sacramento. Um, and on the day that that bill passed, I decided that I needed to take this fight to a higher level, to a larger level. Um, I decided to take this fight to a national level, um, and then even higher than that to, I decided to take the fight to God. And so I started my organization and I started to build a coalition of all these different faith leaders. So I work with rabbis, pastors, priests, imams, um, monks. I work with all different faith leaders throughout the nation and some outside of uh, the US that all believe despite whatever their religious differences may be on other things such as you know maybe abortion or gay marriage, they all agree on the religious freedom of vaccine choice. And so that's how my organization for us, Freedom of Religion United Solutions got started in 2019. Um, I always knew that adult mandates were coming. Um, I said that back in 2015 when I was trying to overturn SB 277 with a referendum. Um, I led LA County with the SB 277 referendum in um, getting signatures and my argument with every single person walking out of Ralph's Market or Air One or wherever I went and stood was adult mandates are coming. And everybody would, you know, people who didn't, couldn't see that far into the future were just like, that's crazy. And I would say again and again, adult mandates are coming. If they're doing this now to our children, you will be next. Please get on board. Um, and now look at where we are. I had no idea it would go this quickly with COVID. Uh, COVID is the perfect storm to pass whatever mandates and craziness that they want to do. Um, and so, you know, here we are, they are mandating, again, like you said, mandates are not laws. There is no law in California mandating the COVID vaccine for work or for school. That law does not exist. Our legislators have never voted on that. Um, I do believe that a law like that will be coming around the corner, probably in the um, early next year, because 
We have a senator in California named Senator Pan, who I personally believe is evil. Um, he's the one who's done all these uh, mandate laws in the past. He's written all these bills. I'm pretty certain that he's got one coming for the COVID vaccine. Um, but as of right now, your school is, when your school tells you that your kid must be mandated to get the COVID vaccine in order to attend school, that is not, that's not law, it's a lie. And um, when your work, when your employer is saying, unless you're working for you know, an org a company that's over 100 employees, because now Biden has said, you know. It's not a law. It's not a law, but that's what Biden is saying, is if there's 100 employees that you have to do it. But you can, you can fight it. You can fight every one of these things, every one of these COVID mandates, whether you go to college, whether your children are in elementary school, or high school, whether you work for a 10-person company or a 150-person company, you can fight this. Um, you know, uh, I would say, unfortunately, the military is having the hardest time. My, uh, a project that I've taken on just recently, which is really kind of my heart and soul at the moment, is um, I'm trying to fight these military mandates because we really have a national crisis on our hands. Um, our military, they put their life on the line for America. They put, they give everything. They put their life on the line to protect our country. And right now our government and our people have really turned on them. And so, um, you know, a lot of the, the military are turning in religious exemptions, which I've been helping with. And on my website, there are, there's a page specifically for the Marines and specifically for the Navy that um, you know, tells everybody who wants to get a religious exemption exactly how to go about doing it. There's a lot of hoops that they have to jump through. Um, in order to, they have to justify their religious beliefs, which then has to be judged by a military chaplain, which then has to go on to a higher, you know, to a commander. Um, and it's, it's near impossible. And what's happening is so all of these brave men and women, our bravest men and women in the military are being denied a religious exemption. And so they are being kicked out of the military. Um, so when you think about that, imagine, Imagine our military right now losing like 25% of our military and then the rest of them uh, all being forced vaccinated. And you know, we, there are no long-term studies on this vaccine. And I know you've been vaccinated and so, but the fact is, is there really is no long-term so, study on any of these vaccines. So it, was, we, it was a totally personal choice for a number of reasons that we made, one of which is so other people would be comfortable. Yeah. So I can serve other people with, and, and go to a funeral and someone say, Rabbi, are you vaccinated? And, I, and by saying yes, they felt more comfortable with me right. being there. And I want to be able to be there with people and, and let them be comfortable in their tragedies or in their joys, whatever it may be. Right. And I mean, it's always a personal choice. Whoever wants to get vaccinated, by all means, go right ahead. Um, I am not going to get vaccinated. And it would take I mean, there's nothing anybody could do to get, make me get vaccinated at all. And so, um, and I would risk losing whatever job, whatever college, you know, uh, my life, my health is more important. And, and like I said, there, there is no long-term study. So we don't know what's going to happen in a year from now or in five years from now from the vaccine. And so, you know, our whole military, if they're being, those who didn't get it, they left. And then those who did get it, we don't know what's going to happen to them. And if, God forbid, something negative develops from this vaccine, then we've lost our entire military. Um, and I just want you to think about what that looks like for America's future if we don't have a military. Uh, so right now, my number one project um, is we have a letter that I've, I'm working with a group of military. And actually, one's here tonight, maybe. <laughs> but um, I'm working with a group of, uh, of military guys that uh, we've written a letter to the Armed Services Committee 
the committees, the Congressional Armed Service Committee, and um, asking for a halt in the vaccine mandate and transparency, because right now there is absolutely no transparency with what has created this decision. What What is their decision based on? Especially if you think about our military, like, there's some of the healthiest people you know, that we've got. Um, and COVID, the fact is, is COVID is 99.7% survivable. Um, and so you take someone who's in our military who's extremely healthy, and they have a really great survival rate. So we're asking for transparency. Um, we have put this letter out there, and uh, we've gotten some incredible support. There are a lot of celebrities who are signing it. It's on the homepage of um, my organization's website, and I welcome everyone here to sign it and support and share it. Um, we have celebrities, we have incredible organizations, we've got some senators, it's very bipartisan. We have um, a Democrat assembly member who signed it, we have a California senator who signed it, um, and so that right now is my passion, is, is helping our military, because without our military, we have no America. Um, and then, you know, obviously the children, the chi I have ch two children of my own, they um, are my everything. And so this fight is for them and their future. Uh, you know, I do everything I do is for them. And, and let's look at it from a Jewish perspective for a moment. Forget, I, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, okay? Um, but if the vaccine works, then why should I care if someone else is around me who isn't vaccinated? And if the vaccine doesn't work, why should I care if they're vaccinated? <laughs> I mean, this is just Talmudic logic. I mean, you know, kind of go, those of you who know me know I kind of go back to that, that simple place. And there are other alternatives as well. If I own a restaurant, and, or I, I own whatever it may be, and, I, and I, let's say my 93-year-old grandmother, my grandmother would be much older than 93 right now, but let's say my 93-year-old grand, grandmother um, lives with me, and I wanna, I'm a little nervous about her health. Well, I, I, it's, it's my, if it's my restaurant, shouldn't I be able to keep it protected in some way? But that doesn't mean I need to require a vaccination. Would you have a problem if someone said, you know what, I'd like you to test before you come down to my resort? Would you be okay with that or not okay with that? No, honestly. No, I wouldn't be. Okay, so tell them why. <laughs> tell them why. Why would I not be okay to test? Why would test? you not be okay? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, it's no, nobody's business about my medical anything, okay. you know? Uh, right, you know, I look at these vaccine cards that people have to show, and you know, it's going on right here in Los Angeles. The people are having to show proof of vaccination. I, I'm sorry, but I don't think that that's any better than having a door that's for, you know, black people and a door well, for white people. Well, let's talk about it for a second. How many of you have heard of the Yellow Star? Okay. And there have been some people who have said that mandatory vaccinations are the Yellow Star. Right? And as far as I'm concerned, I will never ask anyone for their papers because that gives me the heebie-jeebies. Okay, it just makes me. How many of you realize the history of the Yellow Star? It did not start with Nazi Germany. The Yellow Star started in the eighth century with the Caliphates. And the Yellow Star was because according to science of the time, Jews carry diseases. And we don't want to get their disease, so we're going to mark them and segregate them. Sound familiar? That was able to morph over time into, since Jews carry diseases and we've already segregated them, obviously they're not as good of humans as us. So does it really matter if we experiment or put them in a camp? I'm not comparing what we have to Nazi Germany. What I am saying is the history of the Yellow Star is no different than what we're experiencing with vaccination mandates. Okay, there's a theological, there's a historical reality to that. And it's interesting, I, it, I want your vaccination card, but I couldn't have your HIPAA laws, I couldn't see any of your rest of your medicine, could I? No. You're a I doctor, mean, right? I'm not allowed to do any of that, right? No, I mean, I, okay, here's the thing. I help people get religious exemptions, you know, every single day. I've helped thousands, my organization has helped thousands of people 
get religious exemptions to stay in school to keep their job, do I think that people need to show a religious exemption to prove their religion, to no. prove that they're not gonna get vaccinated? No, I don't think that it should even go that far. Right now, I'm, I'm doing this because I wanna help people because not everybody can just walk away from their job. Not everybody can allow themselves to be fired. Um, we live in a, you know, especially in California where everything is the, super expensive. You can't just leave your job. Um, and so I'm doing what legally, what our constitution says, our constitution, our first freedom, our first amendment, first thing right on the constitution is that we have the right to religious freedom. And, um, you know, I suggest everybody read the constitution, read the Civil Rights Act, know your rights. Um, because when you're being told that you can't come in here because you're not vaccinated or you can't work here because you're not vaccinated or you can't go to school there because you know, you're know you not vaccinated, it's, it's all completely going against our constitution, which is what our country has been founded on. And it uh, goes against the Civil Rights Act. And not only that, but in California, we have another Civil Rights Act called the UNRWA. It's U-N-R-U-H, the UNRWA Civil Rights Act. And that also brings into fact the, um, it looks at your genetic, that you can't be discriminated against because of medical reasons, genetic reasons, color, race, marital status. So California actually has a really great Civil Rights Act that is completely being ignored. So, um, you know, I really suggest that everybody needs to do their homework and really like learn what the law is because what they're saying, what our media is telling us the law is, is a bold-faced lie. What your school is telling you about your children, uh, and I'll tell you, SB 277, now, if you wanna opt out of a childhood vaccine today, that's impossible, unfortunately, because that is law. So if you don't want to give your child the MMR shot, or the chickenpox shot, or the hepatitis B, um, you don't want to do that and you want to send your child to school, it's impossible. Um, and so, but with COVID, COVID is not, SB 277 is from 2015. That's, you know, COVID didn't exist then. So COVID is not on SB 277. So when they tell you that it's mandated, it's not. Unless they can prove to you that COVID is listed as one of the vaccines on SB 277, which it is not, there's no, they, you, you have a, a fight there. And the other thing that's part of that fight is I, I received a phone call today from someone who filled out for religious exemption and he was told by his employer, um, you need to have your rabbi fill out these forms for us because we don't believe that this is really your belief. Um, and what I said to him is, look, I, I'll fill out anything. It doesn't bother me, but my suggestion is to first respond to them saying, I don't need to fill out anything. But it that's is true. Because no organization gets to tell you what you believe. Right. That is the actual establishment clause. The establishment clause is that, this, that the United States will not establish any religion. Okay? And over 200 years, we have case history of the courts staying away from religious issues. All right? So if a, and I'll give you a great example. If a pastor or a rabbi wants to sue his community, he can't take it to court because the courts won't take it. He's got to be paid for his past services, uh, but if they, they, they've accepted that the pastor is the voice of that church community, and if the church wants a different pastor, they got to pay him for his past services, but it doesn't matter if he's got a contract. Okay, he serves at the will. And so they, the courts don't want it to get involved in that. Um, and they've traditionally for over 200 years not wanted to get involved in that. So, don't accept just because someone says to you, you have to do this. It's not a, you may not want to do it, and if you don't, don't think that you have to. But it may mean a fight. Don't, don't kid yourself. I think, that's, I think that's really important to realize it's hard. Um, there is a Commodore or Commander? Commander. Yeah. Um, so if you could briefly tell your, your, your story, Commander, is that's okay? Because I think you have, uh, this gives an example. I just want people to understand that if you step up, uh, 
what can happen. Now remember, we come from the tradition of the Maccabees. So can I, before yeah. anybody starts telling stories or any questions, I just wanted to say, um, on our website, we have exemptions for everyone. So we have exemptions for first responders. We have exemptions for healthcare workers. We have exemptions for teachers, for the average Joe, for college students. For We have a specific exemption for California children, which is not a religious exemption. It's a PBE, which is a personal belief exemption. And that's the first one on our exemption page. Um, and our exemption is, like what you were saying, uh, you know, people are coming to me all, I get emails all the time saying that, um, you know, my employer needs further proof that I am Jewish or Christian or that I believe whatever I believe. And really they're not even supposed to ask you that. Um, so our exemptions, but I mean, obviously if you have, and I've connected many people to pastors or rabbis, like I send all of our, every Jewish request goes right here. And, <laughs> and so, um, but uh, our exemptions on our website, the thing that makes them a little bit more solid than a, you know, a written letter or something like that is that um, our legal team included a section at the bottom for a notary. And so notaries are, you know, they're people of the state. So when you take the exemption into a notary, you have an actual witness who notarizes it, signs it, and then stamps it by the state. So, um, you know, it just makes it a little bit more uh, solidified. Um, I also want to say we have an exemption on our website for domestic travel. I can't do anything for going outside of the U.S., but, um, you know, because our Constitution doesn't apply to outside of the U.S., but we do have an exemption for domestic travel and for um, medical procedures. I've had several requests, several emails from people saying that their surgeon will not do surgery unless they are vaccinated. And um, they've been able to use our exemption in order to get the surgery that And I they understand need. from at least one case, a gynecologist has said, I will not take you through labor unless you're vaccinated. Yeah, the, I'm hearing a lot of these really crazy stories. I mean, it's really crazy what's going on. So we can keep time. I, I do want to hear, uh, Commander, if, if Orlando, maybe you can pass the phone to the commander for a brief, oh, you've got one, great. Oh, not the phone, the microphone. Um, if you could just briefly, uh, you know, give us, uh, you know, because this is an example of what, ha what can happen. Don't, I, I really, it's really important to me that everyone goes in with their eyes open, okay? We made a choice as a temple, I made as a rabbi, our board made, we all made a choice to keep our doors open. And there have been consequences. As I said, my house was vandalized. There have been consequences, okay? You need to know that when you're walking into something, you need to know what really is on the other side. So Commander, I'm would you I'm gonna just gonna... suggest one thing so that he doesn't get into any kind of trouble, is maybe don't give your name. And stay over and there. don't come onto the camera because, you know, Thank, thank well, we you can guys. tell you're a commander because you're in much better shape than anyone else in this room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling really wimpy and out of shape right now, so I just wanted to thank you for that, Sorry, sir. Right. <laughs> uh, first, thanks for, for allowing me to speak and share my, my story. Uh, second, I apologize for coming in late. Sincere apologies. Uh, iPhone brought me to Ralph's, which ironically, one of my closest friends in high school was Jewish and his father's name was Ralph, so I thought, this is, this is an interesting place for a temple. <laughs> Ironic. And uh, we even sell pork too, so. <laughs> um, Not in our temple, though we don't. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak, but also to stay off camera. Uh, there was some facts that I learned today um, that affect what I'm able to talk about here tonight. Um, uh, I'll begin by talking about who I am, uh, a little bit about my history. I am, uh, I was active duty Navy for about 10 and a half years. I was a sonar technician on submarines and then became a logistics officer, uh, served in various commands. I went back to submarines as an officer um, and then went to a small 
atoll in the middle of the Indian Ocean called the British, uh, called Diego Garcia, which is in the British Indian Ocean Territory. Commander, please be aware of giving too much of your own personal history. Yeah, understand. Okay. Thank you. Um, served in Afghanistan, a uh, few tours in Afghanistan, served in, sorry, served in, in Iraq uh, and Saudi Arabia recently. Uh, after, after 10 years of active duty, I transitioned into the reserves, which was about 12 years ago. I've been in the reserves for about 12 years and I'm still in. I had a retirement date set and approved of one December and one of the, one of the circumstances that I'm in right now caused that uh, retirement to be held in abeyance while I am investigated. Um, one of the, one of the, specifically on uh, UCMJ Uniform Code of Military Justice Article 138, which is uh, conduct on becoming an officer and a gentleman. Uh, that is because I asked a question at God Speak Church about three weeks ago, which led to an interview that was published and uh, that's resulting in me being investigated. I learned that today. Um, so I'm also a, a federal civilian. Uh, where I, when I transitioned into the reserves, I became a, a federal employee working for the Navy as well. So I have two, I was served with two orders, one for, for, as a uniformed military service member and one as a federal civilian. Uh, I am in the executive branch twofold uh, as a uniformed military service member as a reservist and also as a federal, federal civilian in the DOD, the executive branch. And so I'm beholden to the um, executive branch orders. Um, Rabbi, you, you said you, one of, the, one of the, the lessons that I'll take away from this is that, is that whispering, uh, the whispering of intuition. And I think one of the things that everyone struggles with, especially people who have to articulate their deeply held religious beliefs and how it relates to the vaccine is how do you translate the whispers into, into words? And how do you put that onto paper that's defensible uh, against the scrutiny of the chain of command? Um, that's been a struggle. I like you, uh, you called it uh, Talmudic logic. Um, which I'm going to use. Uh, I, I, I kind of break it down to its basic elements and I asked myself, what are the risks? Um, I've been trained to, to make risk-based decisions uh, based on factual information, based on the facts. And um, while numbers can sometimes be deceiving, I think when you're looking at uh, population-wide information about risk, mortality risk, uh, that's one good way to make a risk-based decision, I think. Individuals and governments alike are responsible for making it as an informed decision as possible, balancing the risks. So I looked at, um, so my way of approaching, trying to put into words the, the whispers was to look at the, the risks for me as an individual and then risks at, at large in population size, size groups. So uh, I, I determined that the risk for me was about 23 in 100,000. And this is using data from the CDC uh, so, so that I could defend it using uh, um, government sources. And I, I decided, and, and so when you make a, a risk-based decision, you, you need to make a, a pragmatic trade-off decision. What am, I, what am I sacrificing to make the decision not to get the vaccine? Well, what am I sacrificing if I make the decision to, the, to get the vaccine? And to me, it boils down to a very fundamental Judeo-Christian principle of individual sovereignty. I answer to God and not the government of man. And uh, I think we all share that. Um, and it's a fundamental underlying principle of American, the American system of governance founded on well, our founding fathers went back to John Locke, who is a British philosopher, um, who argued in his, his uh, one of his writings, two treatises of government, that we are sovereign and answerable to God. So was I willing to trade off my individual sovereignty for a 23 in 100,000 uh, chance of, of a fatal case of COVID-19? And I wasn't, and I'm not. Um, Okay, Commander, I'm going to interject because I don't yes, want too much of your... Can you tell everyone what has happened because you took a stand? What has happened to you without getting to the specifics? Yes. How your life has 
you know, your life was soaring along in whatever way or submarining along in whatever way, <laughs> and whatever it may be, um, and, and you made a decision. And, and how you made the decision, everyone has to achieve their own, their own way. But you made a decision and you chose to act on it from a place of responsibility, consciousness, and spiritual awareness as you view God in your deeply held spiritual belief. What, what, what has happened to you as a, in, in very simple, specific terms so everyone really can understand that they want to go into this fight. It's not a fight to take lightly. Can you explain what you have had to deal with in the DOD and, and in your different... Yeah, so today is a, a really... Um, the timing is perfect to, to accentuate. Of the course, we're series. temple. <laughs> My timing's not perfect. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, there was a, a preliminary investigation launched uh, to, to explore uh, the circumstances surrounding the article in which I was interviewed. Um, I, I'm an open book person, so when asked questions, I gave my honest opinion. Um, so my, it, 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 the, the specific consequences are my retirement, which was originally approved for one December, is now in abeyance. Uh, I am subject to potential proceedings under the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. What would you say is subject to proceedings? That means? So I have been interviewed by, I've, I've been served with the notice that I, that I have um, in, 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 in potential violation of UCMJ 130 code, or Article 138. The preliminary investigating officer will submit their uh, opinion after doing their preliminary investigation to the adjudicating authority, which is a, a commanding officer. He will then make a decision whether or not to honor the recommendations of the, of the preliminary investigation or to uh, subject me to a UCMJ, non-judicial punishment, so a proceeding where it's a military proceeding where there are three people who will judge my case. Uh, I can refuse that or I can request a courts martial. The risk of going to courts martial, there's a benefit of going to court martial in that the proceedings are there's a more robust examination of the facts in a more uh, sort of more formal judicial proceeding. It is judicial punishment as opposed to non-judicial punishment. Um, the, the negative, the, the, the risk of going to courts martial is that I could get a bad conduct discharge, uh, which would then withhold my, my benefits uh, as that I've accumulated as a, a retirement age reservist. And it would do more than that, wouldn't it? You'd be prohibited from certain other uh, liberties that all other Americans who are not felons are allowed, right? You would no longer be able to carry a, a firearm. Yeah, so um, right. I, my 22-year my career, the worst thing that I've ever done was be counseled for, being, for missing a department head meeting as a lieutenant junior grade. So I, have, I am not well-versed in the consequences of a bad conduct discharge. I just know that it's bad. Um, I probably should educate myself, uh, <laughs> but I don't... I, Again, like it's it's early in the proceedings, so I'm not sure the consequences. Um, and I and I will then I'll research the potential consequences. When and I your to federal it. civilian job? Uh, so my federal civilian job, we have a deadline of 22 November to be vaccinated. Uh, there's a process by which there's a there's a timeline, and technically I've, I sh I should already have been vaccinated at least once, uh, gotten one of the first two, two dose series. Uh, and it's ambiguous, unfortunately. The, the consequences, I've talked to the chain of commands. Um, I have a, a, I printed out an email that kind of represents my confusion. Um, my, my management yesterday, for example, uh, came out with an email that said, you're encouraged to submit, or you're, you're encouraged to submit your, uh, your exemption requests as soon as possible to avoid potential consequences or disciplinary action. So I responded by saying, well, What's 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 causing the sense of urgency on on the submission of our exemption request, uh, and then secondarily, what will be the specific consequences uh, if we don't submit as soon as possible? And he came back to me and said, oh, "I really meant submit it on time, and the consequences are not well defined yet." So, it's 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 interesting. So I guess there, there's a takeaway here, if I may. Right. That's the point. Be forthright in your communications. If you have a question, ask it. Um, I do have a reputation at my command for being open and talking 
<laughs> I, I wear my thoughts on my sleeve and and I, I feel free to, to talk. However, there are risks that come with that, like a you know, UCMJ proceeding. So, um, uh, but again, like I, I kind of go back to uh, fear sin and fear heaven, I think is, a, is a, something that I would kind of research before coming here because fear God is, I wanted to see how that translated into the Jewish faith. So in, in, in Hebrew, it's actually not fear, it's Yirat Hashem. And actually the better translation is being in awe of God. I see. That everything is in the hands of God except being in the awe of God. Um, but, but so just simply put, after decades of career, you could lose your pension, get a dishonorable discharge or bad conduct discharge, potentially, potentially stopping you from liberties. Lose medical benefits. Lose medical benefits, pension benefits on that one side. And on the job side, they're making a bunch of ambiguous threats that they're keeping very vague. And, and I think that's important for everyone to understand. If you look at patterns, what is happening over and over, you must get vaccinated by this date or else, right? And then that date comes close, and the, whether it's the mayor of Chicago or whatever it may be, he says, well, because we care about you, we're gonna postpone it to this date or else. Okay, and what is the or else, and are they going to keep postponing it down the road because it is unconstitutional? All right, just let's be clear on that. They do not have the right to do this based on your discernment. So, but you could lose your, and, and your job right now is both, without getting into the details, your daily job is as a federal employee. Yes. And your pension, you have this other whole pension because of all the amazing service, and thank you for your service. It's my honor. Right. Um, and you could lose all of the, they've already told you you could lose everything from the pension and the medical part for what you've done. And you've got an or else hanging over your head. Correct. With a random date. Correct. Okay, that can happen to everyone who wants an exemption. We, we are, my family is preparing for the potential loss of my job, which is our primary source of income. Uh, we would then liquidate our house and move to a less a costly part of the country. Which is pretty much anywhere except Manhattan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or San Francisco, and who would want to be either of those places. Anyway, so I, I, thank you. Yes, thank sir. you very much. So, so uh, you really thank need you so to much. hear that. Okay, this is a man who's demonstrated his courage throughout his life, throughout his professional career. He lived on a submarine, okay? <laughs> okay, I mean, he, he's really, yeah, how do you do that? Uh, ask him, I have no, I could never live on a submarine. Hey, Commander? <laughs> How do you guys play beach volleyball on a submarine? Uh, <laughs> but the point is that he's demonstrated throughout his life courage, and courage comes from the French liqueur to come from our heart. He's demonstrated to that he comes from his heart over and over. And now when he steps up to come from his heart again, which is always inspired by God, the last letter of the Torah is a llama, the first letter is a vet. They spell the word lev, which means heart. What's inside our heart is divine. He's doing that. He may lose everything, God forbid. Okay, and our prayers are with you. I want to, uh, for, for the sake, who, there, there are people here, and, and thank you again so much, especially I, I, for I want to say, he's not, there's thousands, thousands of our military in the exact same position as and him. And firefighters, and paramedics, and, exactly. and police officers, and sheriff's officers. So, nurses, you know, doctors. Re realize that anyone who wants to take that fight, even if you disagree with it, Please have the respect to say, what we say in Hebrew, kol kavod, to give them the honor. Look, I, I, I have, if someone says, look, I, I don't want to be around anyone who's not vaccinated, okay, that's your choice. But instead of castigating someone who's choosing to come from their heart, always honor them for their decisions. I want to open up to, to a few, if there are any questions. Again, let's not get into anything medical anything science-based, anything statistic-based, any study-based, any, study any of that stuff, but actually specifically about religious exemptions on mandatory <laughs> vaccinations, okay? Uh, 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 Orlando, where are you? Yes, yes. Well, where's the microphone? Did you get it back from him? Yes. Yeah. Okay, because when he said he, like, he, he writes on his sleeve, I'm thinking he can write a lot. Um, so, <laughs> so why don't we, uh, David, why don't we start with you and then pass it around maybe a little bit? I don't know that I need a microphone, but I'll use it. <clears throat> of course I do. 
why are there different religious exemptions based on your profession? Or you gave the example different for the Marines, the Navy, et cetera. So for instance, with, in the military, each branch requires something completely different. It's not completely different, it's, they're similar, but they all have their own hoops to jump through. In regards to you know, healthcare workers and first responders and teachers and stuff like that, I actually did that simply for convenience um, and for organizational reasons on my website because I was getting uh, a lot of different emails from, I'm a teacher, which one, what do I do, How, you know? And so we have the teacher category. Um, it helps, especially when they submit it to their employer that here's an exemption specifically for teachers and here's an exemption specifically for first responders. Um, it gives it more validity. And so um, that's a great question. It's really, a religious exemption is a religious exemption. You can write it down on a piece of paper. You can take one from my website. You can get one from a rabbi. You can get one from a pastor. Um, there is no standard religious exemption out there. You just need to you know, say that this is your strongly held belief. And um, I've just made the process a lot more simple. Great, thank you. I, Other, I, go I ahead, have Tim. one more question, but it's for you, Rabbi. If the religious exemption is based on your personally held belief, religious belief, why is there a need or a requirement, or is it for the receiver to have a rabbi's endorsement? I don't think you need a rabbi's endorsement, quite honestly. I don't, you know, constitutionally, certainly you don't. But for many people who are reviewing this, look, we want, it, we, we want to make it as easy as possible for everybody, okay? So here's Mr. Poloni, he's the boss of an organization. And Mr. Schwartz comes up and says, I don't believe I should do this, okay? Not gonna do this. And it's my sincerely held religious belief. And Mr. Poloni has as much knowledge about Judaism as, you know, he, know, he knows Gornish, he knows nothing. Uh, to have something else that just says, look, you know what, this is in line with Judaism. And to understand that, first of all, it's in line with Judaism, but Judaism's not monolithic. You will get plenty of rabbis who will say, they're wrong, by the way, about using Pekuach Nefesh. They can use other logic, but that logic is, is wrong. But they will say, you know, that you should get vaccinated. But there's the Jewish attitude that this is okay. We enhance free will and we empower it. You actually don't need it and you shouldn't need it. Unfortunately, sometimes perceptions are, are reality. And so it's just an extra piece of, of state and it also makes people more comfortable who are going through it to talk sometimes to clergy trust me it'd be a lot easier if all these people who wanted exemptions just wrote their own notes and, and i didn't spend the time on the phone because you you know my family david so you know it's a little time consuming there's a hand up right over here the young lady right here behind david david you have the microphone right hang on one second oh, okay. hang on excuse me um she's got the microphone next the reason we're passing the microphones around is because we're streaming and that is the only way they can hear anything that you're saying Okay. okay, so please hold the microphone close and speak into it. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, so you should say your name too, oh, if you're comfortable with that. Yeah, sure. My name is Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, so I wanted to ask about, I have two questions actually. One of them is um, because there is religious exemption in here in America, how come when it comes to Jewish religious exemption, how come it's not when you search about Israel and rabbis in Israel, they're saying that there is no such a thing as religious exemption, um, and you cannot say you don't want to have vaccine as a, as a religious, you know, Jewish religious belief. Are you talking about from rabbis in Israel or rabbis in America? Rabbis in Israel. Okay, there are plenty of rabbis in Israel who uh, think that you should be able to be exempt. And, and, and that's a fight have, going on in Israel. I have a, a rabbi from Israel who's part of my organization. Oh. Um, and he's written some really great, he has a great website. And so every faith leader that I work with, um, we have a page on our website with all the different faith leaders throughout the country and throughout the world. And usually they have links to whatever, you know, 
website they have or if they belong to a church or a temple or they have a YouTube channel. So there is um, a rabbi that I work with from Israel who's on in my organization and if you go scroll the page that's all the different faith leaders, you can find him and click on his website and he's got some really great stuff there. And, 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 understand, I'm just gonna interject something. So understand that the, both the CCAR and the uh, rabbinic assembly, so both the reform and conservative movements have issued their opinion that you should take a, that you should get vaccinated. And is, now, is I, I, That doesn't mean, by the way, that they are right and there may be other reasons in many of these cases why you may choose, why a rabbi, how do I phrase this politely? <laughs> there are a number of rabbis who I've spoken with in the last 18 months who said to me, Michael, that's my first name, sorry, um, who said, uh, Michael, uh, you're right, we should keep our doors open, but if I do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose my donors and we're out of business. Yep. To which my response was, if that's what you believe, rabbis lead and don't follow and get off your tulkas and do what you're supposed to do. True. Okay, so that's just my take on it. So, but understand that, that the official position of both the reform and conservative movements is, you know, front, which are not enforceable and have nothing to do with anything, by the way, but their official true vote are, and the one for the conservative movement I, was written, I believe was written by a great scholar named uh, David Lincoln, uh, are that for, that, that you should be required to take a vaccination. But understand something else in Jewish law, and everyone needs to understand this. There's a great story. What a surprise. <laughs> There's a great there's a great story. A rabbi walks into a village. He sees all these bullseyes. He says, who's your archer? The village guy says, Shmuley, the nine-year-old. So he goes to Shmuley. He says, did you do all these bullseyes? He goes, yes, sir, I did. He goes, how did you do them? He goes, it's easy. I shot the arrow, then I drew a target around it. <laughs> okay? And often, everybody, including rabbis, will say, okay, this is where I want to end up, so I'm going to draw a target around it. Okay, yeah. so un un understand that, but it, uh, but it is the position of both the reform, uh, the CCAR and the RA, the two, the reform and conservative <laughs> movements, uh, rabbinic groups that, um, that, that, uh, that are, are that these should be mandatory. Look, it was the opinion of the Board of Rabbis in Los Angeles that you're supposed to, we, we should all have, you know, canceled and streamed our services last year as well, and, and not this past one, but the one before, and, and um, I had a conversation with a rabbi who said, we're going to stream it, it's gonna be great, we're gonna pre-tape it, we're gonna have production values, we're gonna have this orchestra. I said, great, so you wanna compete with Netflix and not have a prayer service. <laughs> find your own rabbi, find your own answer. That is Judaism, okay? Find the ones that sing to you and use those arguments. Elu elu. these words and these words are both words of Torah. And I totally respect Rabbi Galinkin and I respect his opinion. I just disagree with it. Yeah. And and in Israel, is it protected? Like here, it's protected in the constitutional law. In Israel, is it protected by any law that I have the freedom? I don't. Of I don't know religious liberty law in Israel. Okay. I'm just a rabbi. I barely know religious <laughs> liberty law in America. <laughs> there, I'll tell you that most countries do not have what we have with the constitution, which makes America so great. Um, you know, I know Canada. They have nothing right to, that is protecting the people. So um, one thing that's one of the reasons why we have to fight is because we have to fight to preserve what America is and what America, what we have with America. Um, in America, we have a constitution. It is what our country is founded on, and you know our liberty and our we have right there religious freedom um, written in our constitution. That's why we all have to fight to protect it right now because the current administration is about to put our constitution through a shredder. And so we have to do everything we can to fight to protect our country and to protect our American values. And, and all, that actually brings me to my next question which I wanted to ask how come how come the law, as 
P277, I think yes. you said. It's how come it pass if it's actually go against the constitutional law? Well, we have some very corrupt uh, legislators in California that are paid a lot of money from unions and from other entities. Um, unfortunately, right now, like all these, any bill that passes, it's, it's a money game. That's really what it is. Who's gonna, you know, I had, on the day that SB 276 passed, I spoke with a senator. Um, spoke with a Republican senator who he fought really, really hard to, you know, kill SB 276. And he said to me, he goes, you know, if we, all the, all the people that were up fighting in Sacramento, and there were thousands of us, thousands of parents, thousands of grandparents, um, just kids, everybody up at, at Sacramento, it was amazing. Um, but he had said to me, when we had this conversation after it had passed, he said to me, he goes, you know, if you had the unions on your side who could just put down bags of money on the desks of these legislators, it would be no issue. Do you so. know? Do you know, Shannon? If anyone, if that, if anyone has uh, challenged the constitutionality of the of the that bill? Yeah. So there have been lawyers. There's been lawyers that I've spoken with. Has it gone to? Has it um, progressed it, up to the Supreme Court? It has not. Okay. Um, you know, it gets tossed out. Um, okay. So. All right, other questions? Because I, I know people are getting time wise, and I want to I want to kind of move quickly through this. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Eddie. Uh, I have four children. All Mazel tov. Thank you. Uh, all attending school, and pretty soon we're going to have to either vaccinate them, which we're not going to do, and in my situation, I'm self-employed, I can work from anywhere I want, so I'm probably going to leave this state, which I don't really want to, but how does religious exemption work in a school setting, especially when they already have our children's vaccination records and can see that, hey, you know, they got all the schedule. In, in theory or in practice? Difference? So, wait, I... That, that's what, what? a really great question because I get asked that all the time is that if I've vaccinated in the past, why am I not vaccinating now? Yeah. My answer to that is that COVID woke you up. COVID, they put death right on every single news station, death numbers of these people, die, this number of people dying a day, right? So woke you up that you started there, to look into. There's a simpler answer. There's really a simpler <laughs> answer. Because that's, that comes under the place of saying that you now have decided all vaccinations are bad or whatever it may be. You're using a logic. The logic from a religious perspective is you don't need to have, you know what? I got measles vaccinations for my kids because that felt right. God has told me not to get this one, so I'm not. That's simple. So that Keep was the going there. <laughs> <laughs> keep the guess. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, keep the answer simple to them. Just tell them it's not their business. Well, it's you know not what? their business. But what I was going to say is that death has been in the face of everybody. And so it's caused people to turn to God. It's caused people to open their eyes, open their hearts, open their minds to God and say, let me look into this. Let me figure this out. Because what do I need to do now? And so... I, I have a simple question to ask someone who would pose that to me. Okay. I would simply ask the person, especially, and I, and I try not to ask questions I don't know the answer to already when it comes to these kind of arguments. Um, I like to ask questions to learn, but this isn't one of them. Um, the question of, uh, well, I have a question. Are you married? Yes, Rabbi, I am. Did you go out with other women beforehand? Yes, Rabbi, I did. <laughs> she went out with a lot of other women. She chose to get married, right? I had a lot of other vaccinations. This is the one I don't want to have. <laughs> That's a good answer. Okay, so it's just that simple. Okay, <laughs> we are not monolithic beings. We are not. We don't have to be consistent with that. Okay, but stop. One of the things is, you know what? We don't need to run and hide. We can step up and and confront back, like the commander has or other people has. Ask the question. Make the comment, please. Let's go on. I like okay. that. Okay, I. My name's Karen. I my religious exemption was accepted, and then this week I got follow-up questions. Um, so I'm not sure what that means. And so one of the questions is, okay, I I went ahead and submitted my answers. I figured I'll go ahead and play along with it. But once it's finally accepted, can they take it away from you? 
I'm going to answer a question with a question because that's what rabbis do, don't we? Mm -hmm. um, Karen, Germany was a free country. Could they make it a non-free country? The Soviet Union was all that the Soviet Union was. Could they make it a free place? Mm -hmm. Could we have perestroika? Life changes. And to a certain level, people or authority or whatever you want to call it can do, or let me phrase it differently. A bully can do whatever they want to do until they're stopped. Mm -hmm. That's, the, so that's, that, that would be the simplest, quickest answer. So let's move along with some rapidity. With respect to that question then, is the best answer no, I'm not answering further, or to play along with their game? I mean, I think every situation is different, and, yeah. and it depends on, you know, I would speak to a lawyer, it depends on how much you want to keep your job, and how much you want to fight back, and, you know, how important is this to you, so, and I've, I've heard that also. I, you're not the first person to say what happened, you know, with that situation. So it's really a matter of just what is what is it that you, how far do you want to take it? Okay, let's go. It's, uh, Mark's pointing us to someone who has a microphone. That let's would go. be me. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, my question is, are there class action lawsuits that we can join and support, like an attorney law firm that's, that's my doing loss. something no. that we can really get involved? Because as individuals, it's hard for us to call a lawyer. Who are we even going to call to help us? Or is there like groups of people that are already forming under like like they I, did I do you know of any that yeah. actually Milken, been filed. Milken right now is organizing a class yeah, action it's not, it's not. There's none filed to my knowledge. Here's what you can do. There's an, or a website, and I, and, and I really recommend this to you. You want to help and you're not sure how, go to a website called Advocates for Faith and Freedom and donate to them. Immediately after you donate to the synagogue and Four United Solutions. <laughs> <laughs> um, Advocates for Faith and Freedom, Bob Tyler, they are the leaders in religious liberty uh, rights and taking these fights. So, so it's really simple. You go to temple, you go to nersimcha.org, then you go from there to click to fouryunitedsolutions.org. There you go from there to Advocates for Faith and Freedom. Rita, where are you? Did I make you happy? Okay. I, I, I don't all. Okay, someone else has a microphone. Let's go. There, there's an organization, it's a PERC, it's a first responders, um, it's Los Angeles, California based, Southern California based, and it's with children and teachers and just Yeah, they have a lawsuit right now. People. PERC yeah, has a lawsuit going on right now okay. as well. Um, Perfect. Other, let's, no, let's, oh, you have a question? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, my name is Victor. Um, I was just kind of wanted to hear you guys' opinions on how to um, navigate retaliation um, in the workplace. Okay. I work in a hospital. Oh. I, I, so I think the answer to that I'm, I'm going to ask a favor, okay? Because I know exactly what I'd like to say about that. And you heard me say something similar at the prayer breakfast a few weeks ago. I'd like you to hold that question and be the last question we ask. Is that fair, Victor? Okay, someone else, please. Yeah, because I think it's an important question on, on much deeper levels than retaliation in the workplace. Go on. What could it look like to get a vaccination uh, exemption for my child so she can stay in school? What do you mean, what, what will it look like? Like, um, I mean, we're, we're hearing a lot about adults speaking for themselves. I want to speak for my child. Same process. Saying that she has a religious... It's your family religious exemption. You are in charge of your, of, of your child. I'm looking at her, I think she's a minor. Um, <laughs> she looks like she could do all of <laughs> We have, so on our website, there's for California students, right now you want to file a, what's called a PBE. It's the first exemption on the religious exemption page. It's specific, we had a lawyer, a lawyer has written it up. Uh, this was a lawyer that was very involved in SB 276, so he knows the law very well, and he's written a um, PBE specifically for 
what's going on right now with the COVID vaccines and California. So you're going to want to get the PBE. You just go to the forunitedsolutions.org and you click on religious exemptions and they're all listed right there, but the California one for California children is the number top one. So you just want to print that out and okay. it's a little bit different than, and also um, my card and there's information on the table outside when you leave. Um, take that, it. Yeah, take, take my information. Don't email me asking for her information. Right. And, uh, and like he said, we are a, we're a nonprofit organization. We're 501c3. So, you know, really donations help a lot. Um, and we're a very non-for-profit organization right now, apparently. <laughs> but so, for so instance, like our organization, I get asked to speak throughout the country. Um, so your donations help me travel to different speaking engagements. They help me bring the rabbi with me last couple weeks ago to Miami for... Um, so my boys could play golf <laughs> and do so well. All right, Joel, we're going to move on. Uh, so make sure you pick up cards. Joel, you had something real quick. Joel? Yes. Uh, just one or two more, and then we're going to come back to you, Victor, okay? My name is Bob. And, I'm sorry, uh, wait, wait. Why did I just say Joel, Bob? What's that? Why did I just say Joel when I called went to Bob? Why did I just call you by your son? Well, I know. Why did I just call you by your son's name? Well, it's a much more biblical name than Bob. It's, <laughs> it's a better I just name. did that. I apologize, Robert. <laughs> Uh, as the commander said, I believe in the sovereignty of our own body, our own being. Uh, when you ask for an exemption, are you not moving then the choice away from yourself and toward the government? Could you speak to that? Yeah, um, I kind of, I said something a little bit about that earlier. It's like, look, I don't believe that anybody needs to prove their religion. No one should have to prove their religion in order to opt out of a vaccination, which is a medical procedure. So no one should have to prove their well, religion. Even more clearly, then no one, legally, no one has to. Legally? legally constitutionally, no one has to. Yeah, no one, and no one should have to do that. It should not be necessary. Um, do I think that everybody should be filing religious exemptions? You know, I mean, if you could just go to your employer and say, no, I don't want to get vaccinated, and that's what it is, and accept it as it is, that would be wonderful. Um, and I think that everybody should try that. But if they say, no, you're going to need to file a religious exemption, well, then you're going to have to file a religious exemption if you want to keep your job. Um, it's, one, it's one method of fighting back, and, you know, we have to keep fighting back in every possible way we can. Okay, just a couple more questions because we really do need to. My question is about the testing that they're subjecting, subjecting the children to weekly. And now it's come to my district because I have musicians in my family and they play instruments that require blowing. So your question is? It's not a law. Why do we have to do it, and how? Uh, you and I are going to have different feelings it. on this. <laughs> um, uh, first which, of all, it's not a law, and you don't have to. Okay. Yeah. That being said, we have different feelings on this. We we, we look at this the same issue differently. So why don't you you first uh, about about? Um, you know, testing. so my organization, we only strictly work with religious exemptions for vaccines. We don't do religious exemptions for testing. I think it's a lot harder to prove a religious reason that you don't want to be tested. Um, I am with you right there. I agree. I, I pulled my kids out of school. My kids were at LA Unified, and I'm homeschooling them now because I don't trust the school systems at all in California. Um, and so, you know, I don't trust them with testing. I don't trust them with the even the material that they're teaching i don't trust california schools um and so but i know that homeschool is not for everyone and it was a huge decision that i had to make um but you know in regards to testing i don't there's it's hard to get i i would say it's hard to get a religious exemption uh for testing maybe you could possibly get a medical exemption if you found a doctor or a psychologist or therapist who said that it's causing severe anxiety or something like that, um, that would be the best route to, to go in that. 
and, and, and where I stand on it is, and our children also started doing homeschooling last year, and they are now in a, a sort of a hybrid homeschool and charter experience, because um, I too do not, my experiences of the school system is this is not the education that I believe my children need to get. Um, I'd like them to learn, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Little, little things, music, science, you know. Um, I'm not interested in revisionist history. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm in the same place in terms of homeschooling and, and this particular charter, which is kind of a hybrid. Um, I am all for testing. I have no issue with testing. Um, I, from where I stand, if, if it's your restaurant and you want me to come in and you want to know that I've been tested, I'm cool with that, okay? That, that you want to know that someone has. Um, I, I don't have a problem with that religiously or, or theologically. Um, and I don't know, not saying there isn't. I do not know of, I cannot think off the top of my head of a religious argument from a Jewish perspective that would exempt you from being tested. Um, I, 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 I'm sorry? Uh, the, the testing? But yeah. you, you would have a much easier way getting a medical exemption saying that, for instance, I have yeah. a seven-year-old who, you know, there's no, it, it's like, he's had to be tested before just because we've been around people who have had COVID and we wanted to make sure and, you know, I don't want my mom to get COVID and stuff. So um, we've had to test my seven-year-old and it is like as if it's the end of the world. And so if he had to do that on a weekly basis, I would be causing him trauma. And so I would never allow that for my child. I'm not gonna put my child through trauma. Um, and so in that case, if I had to send him to school, I would go to a doctor or therapist or something who would write a medical exemption. A psychologist saying, probably could help with that, a child psychologist, the right one. So I just want to say, my I also, I'm a therapist. Um, I'm an educational therapist. I've been doing that. That's my, my, my doctorate is in psychology. My master's is in uh, special education. So I've actually written, um, but this is completely separate from my organization, but I've written mask exemptions for children who start to hyperventilate or it causes them to even vomit um, because there's so much anxiety with wearing a mask throughout the entire day. So I've, you know, with me, I am able to write exemptions, but again, that's completely separate from my organization, so. So let's get two more questions before we have Victor. Go ahead. Rabbi Barclay, you made a you made a remark in passing that uh, the court will not accept disputes between the clergy and the congregants. Correct. Because the clergy serves at will. Of the, the, clergy, the clergy is considered the voice of the congregants. Or and you mentioned the at will at the time, and it was very much in passing. And how does that differ from the private sector deciding that they want to, <coughs> and this is our situation, that they would, they, um, they, they will. They require all the employees to be vaccinated, <coughs> with um, under pain of being uh, separated. You're fact. much more protected than any clergy. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Because this is our absolutely. situation. Yeah. The, the point is, the point is, the courts don't want to step into cases with clergy because they don't, they don't want to get involved in that and having to do. They've traditionally over 200 years, they have not wanted to get involved in, uh, um, getting involved in religious disputes, in any way. So it's a it's a rabbit hole they've they've really avoided repeatedly going down. Uh, one other question. We're going to come back to Victor. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, I think about the word fear in a different perspective, and I sure do, would like to know your viewpoint. Say an employer requires an employee to get a vaccine. Now there is a there is a, rever a reversal of sort. I mean, they're greatly ill from a vaccine. I would think as an employer, I'd be scared, and then there's a cuss word after that. But uh, I, I, we're, the employers are in trouble more than anyone. One year, two years, 10 years from so now? That's a really great there's question. There's going to be lawsuits. Um, these vaccines, actually any vaccine, childhood and COVID, is, there's no liability whatsoever on anyone. 
There's no liability on the government. There's no liability on the manufacturer. There's no liability on the employer. There's no liability. So, um, you know, back in the 80s, uh, Reagan passed a law saying no liability for the childhood vaccines. Once that happened, they were able to roll out a million more vaccines because there's no liability. Um, this COVID vaccine right now, it's, um, I forgot what it's called, but it's, I think it's under the PrEP Act or something like that, that um, removes liability from the COVID vaccine. So nobody can be sued. Um, I will suggest that everybody look at, there's a website called openvares.com and you can see how many injuries and deaths there are from uh, you know, being reported. Um, and supposedly that's only like 10% of the actual numbers of being reported of different injuries and deaths from the vaccine. But um, again, there is no liability. So uh, it's unfortunate. I, I think if, you know, if they wanna mandate this, if they want to mandate that, then they need to put liability back. Because if they put the liability back, then no one's going to want to mandate it for their employees, right? Yeah. The, the government other, the other piece is, look, you have labor law. Let them fire you. Do your religious exemption, your medical... Uh, uh, so I'm assuming that you, it, it, be, that you go through... You're saying this based upon a religious exemption, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you have expressed your religious belief. If they fire you, you have a case. Go find the right lawyer and... and and you know there is a labor law and religious stuff if that's what you want to do. No one's forcing. You can't be forced. Remember, it is important to let them come and make the action as opposed to you making the action. Okay. One other question, then we're going to end this with Victor Good because you guys are out there. She has no microphone, but she was going like this all night, so I felt it was, you know. Hi. So um, we talked to a lawyer asking about filing an exemption, and he said that public health is above the law. How correct is that? That public <coughs> health is about the law? <laughs> yeah. I know, I had a cough, I'm sorry. Um, uh, above the Constitution. Right. So you're, that lawyer is wrong, Yeah. and he, he's you need to find a new lawyer. Public health is not above the law or above the Constitution at all. Um, that's just a bunch of baloney. And, and, and I'm gonna add something, okay? Without exception in, he, in, in human history, when we base public policy upon the science of the time, we got problems, okay? You don't base public policy on the science of the times. And if your lawyer's saying that, okay, right next to you, Sarah, right? Okay, she, I made the comment to her, find the rabbi that works for you. Yeah. Find the lawyer that works for you, okay? I wanna, I wanna yes, go ahead, last one, please, because we... we, uh, we ha I have a question about the LAUSD. Yes. They can, um, if I'm doing it, they can tell me to that they are not accepted? No, I mean, they're, they can. They can tell you whatever they want to tell right. you. But legally, they can't have you, they can't kick your child out of school legally. So not yet, at least. At this point in time, there is no law in California that says a child must get the COVID vaccine. Okay. So as of today, there's no law. Will there be a law? We Probably, I would say, by February or March. But I, that's going to get contested. Be. There will be a law, and there's going to be suits on it. Mm. There's, and they're going to test the constitutionality, because Bob's going to work on that. Look, understand something. This is changing day by day. I said this earlier. I'd like everyone to please remember this. It's changing constantly, and how are you going to feel if you decide that you want to vaccinate your child or you want to get vaccinated even though you don't feel, you feel like God doesn't want you to? Because this is a religious discussion, and we're kind of getting into the whole vaccination discussion, the medical discussion. And this is a religious discussion, okay? God is telling you in your, in your relationship with God, and you believe that you shouldn't get vaccinated. Judaism empowers you to say no, okay? And now here's my question for you. If you believe that you have divine inspiration to not, uh, divine <coughs> guidance to not get vaccinated, how are you going to feel if you go get vaccinated and a day later all these mandates are, are shown to be unconstitutional? Okay? This is about your relationship. Please, please, please 
do not use religious exemption as an excuse just because you don't want to take a vaccine. Let's please, because it hurts everybody else. If you just happen to not believe in vaccines medically, if you don't believe in this vaccine medically, if you don't believe, if you believe this vaccine will cause harm medically, if you were listening to this doctor or that doctor, Zygosintahate, I bless you. But please don't use religious exemption as the excuse. Please use religious exemption for what it's meant to be. Because the that's what happened with yeah. SB 277 and SB 276, is that when everybody was using religious exemptions, they pulled them and then... And it messes it up for everyone. The commander has risked his life, his family's life, his livelihood and everything else after physically lift, lift, risking his life for decades because of his discernment in his relationship with God, not because... He doesn't like Tony Fauci, or he believes in this doctor or that doctor. It has to do with a sincerely held religious belief. Have the integrity in your own life that if you're going to do this, it is because of those four words. Otherwise, don't do it. Use whatever other reason you want. But please, it's about ethical behavior. Okay? A couple says, we're not vaccinating our children because the first commandment given to human beings is to be fruitful and multiply, and we are concerned that this will affect our ability of our children to ob observe the first commandment. That is a sincerely held religious belief. Don't use it as a, forgive the pun, as a mask. All right? Use it for what it's supposed to be. Because otherwise, you are no different than the person who's forcing you to get vaccinated based on their love of Tony Fauci. So look at your own beliefs. This is a spiritual journey, people. There's a blessing in this COVID. It is forcing us, it is forcing individuals to look inside in their relationship with their God as they relate to it. There is a blessing that... People are trying to push vaccinations, forcing us to look inside our souls and determine what is my deeply held spiritual belief. Find it. Help have clergy in your faith tradition help you. Have texts, Judaism is big on texts. Look at the text to help you discern. Once you've discerned it, then act upon it however you feel is appropriate. But please, do not use the religious exemption card. Please don't. It's like when I walk into a place, I, uh, this happened recently. How many of you know Stonehouse? We love Stonehouse, right? Westlake Village and supports the synagogue. We love Stonehouse. And John Otter's a, a hero. But we, there, I got a call from, from Stonehouse, from the manager of Stonehouse. There was a group of guys there. He calls me up. He goes, Rabbi, is it possible that someone would be eating, would not eat our cheese because it's not kosher while they're drinking our non-kosher wine? <laughs> so that doesn't make any sense, Travis. Why do you ask? And because Stonehouse is their attitude is that you can't bring in food. And so we, there was a group of people who had brought in a bunch of cheese because they didn't want to buy cheese from Stonehouse. He said, <laughs> he said, Rabbi, will you come down here? I said, absolutely. And I came down here and I talked to them and I said, you know, come on, guys. And then when after Travis left, I said, don't you dare play the Jew card again because you're hurting all of us. Don't say religious <laughs> exemption. It's true. Don't say religious exemption. And by the way, I think some of the cheese had a meat in it. Um, don't say religious <laughs> exemption if it's not how you really feel. Okay? Please discern how you feel and act upon it. I want to end with, with Victor. Can, you, can, you, uh, can we get him a microphone? I want, I want you to say your question one more time, please, because I think it's a good question to end this talk with. A, we have to end with a prayer because we're a synagogue. We do that, but go ahead. Go, go ahead. Can you hear me? No. <laughs> Hello? Uh, my question was, uh, what's the best way to navigate retaliation? Okay. I think this is a really important question. How many of you feel, you know, please don't answer this by raising your hands, but look inside, how many of you feel 
like you've been bullied by people who are saying that you need to do this vaccination, your children not get, need to get the vaccination, whatever. You feel bullied. So much so that you're angry. Or that you've experienced politics where friends or family have ostracized you because of your politics, so much so that you're angry at them. And I think it's a really, potentially the most important question of the night, Victor. There's a Midrash story that when God forced the Sea of Reeds to crash upon Pharaoh's soldiers, it's not Red Sea, it's Sea of Reeds, and Pharaoh's soldiers drowned, the angels started to rejoice and dance, and God chastised them, saying the work of my creation is being destroyed and you want to sing psalms of praise. You do not beat darkness with more darkness. Hamas has said I am an enemy. They want me dead. But you know what? I will do whatever I need to do, which may include their destruction. But I take no joy in it. I take no joy in the defeat of my enemy. And I have no hate in my heart. As Shlomo Karlbach, Rabbi Karlbach said, I only have one heart. And that heart's for love. I don't have a heart for hate. And the moment that someone is being abusive and you retaliate to them because they are ostracizing or whatever else, the vaccine is unimportant. You've lost because you lost your own soul. We need to remember in any battle, in any war, in any conflict, and the commander probably can uh, attest to this greater than I ever want to be able to. We need to keep our hearts clear. We need to keep our souls clear. We need to keep our who we are clear. So if you want to ostracize me, look, I got, as I say, my house was vandalized. The next day I went up and, and got a bigger mezuzah that's much larger and more colorful. Um, if someone wants to retaliate by saying, how dare you, you're horrible, that's not bringing people together. Have a legitimate dialogue with them. Understand that that person may feel it intellectually because of all the study they've done, and Elu, the Elu, these words and these words are both holy. Understand that they may be based in fear, as the doctor was saying, and fear leads to, quote the great Rabbi Yoda, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. It's page 17 of the <laughs> And they're scared. And sometimes the best thing you can do when someone is scared is you can stand where you stand without having to attack anyone. It is so, so important that we don't fight darkness with more darkness, but rather stand our ground. We're about in a, a few weeks, we'll be celebrating Hanukkah, Festival of Lights, but Hanukkah means dedication, that we should dedicate ourselves to being together in whatever our beliefs are with respect. The Yoruba people of Nigeria, I see the Yoruba Hausa, say ikune wururuaye bagena, means the secret to life is respect. And I think we got a much better chance of changing people's opinions or the retaliation by showing them respect and caring and still standing strong where we are, as opposed to attacking them with, oh, you crazy, you want this, and I, you know, and Tony Fauci's doing puppy experiments, and how can you trust him, or whatever it may be. And I think that's the most important, to me at least, I think that's the most important issue, is that we need to be peacemakers, we need to bring people together, to trust each other, to respect each other, to treasure each other, and to build relationships. Look, Dr. Shannon and I disagree on some things, okay? Um, she thinks my boys should be playing golf from the championship tees, I think they should be playing from the men's tees. <laughs> But we disagree on some things about vaccinations or things. It doesn't change our love, caring, or respect for each other, right? Right. And to respect someone in their choices and not to retaliate back. But we really, really people please in these times that are so challenging. The challenge isn't the virus, the challenge isn't vaccinations. The challenge is how we treat each other. 
and we need to remember that, please. So uh, that's why I wanted to end with it, because I think that's really the most important teaching. Um, I, I, I would like to say, I gotta stand up again, both because of my back. So first of all, we wanna say thank you to Dr. Shannon and to, <laughs> and to Mark and to Orlando and to Dennis, who is, keeps us all safe here. Um, Dennis is the big guy with the, the firearm on his side, so that, you know, <laughs> he, it's a sad statement that we have to have at synagogue events, isn't it? But we do. So we have a, a, a concept in Judaism um, <coughs> that if you take the word Bereshit, the first word of the Torah, it's, you can transpose the letters and it says Shadav, music, the song of the Father of God. And we believe that people come together and we heal through music, we heal through prayer. And so we have a a beautiful prayer that I would hope you would all join, those of you who know it. O say shalom bim ramav, hu yaase shalom. Aleinu ve'al ko Yisrael, and I would add, v'gam kol ha'olam. Ve'imru amen. May the one who ordains peace in the universe make peace upon ourselves, our communities, our families, our nation, the people of Israel, and the entire world, kol ha'olam. And together let us say, amen. If you know, please join me in a brief. Oh, say shalom bim romav, huya say shalom aleinu, ve'al ko Yisrael, ve'imru, imru, amen. Ya say shalom, ya say shalom, shalom aleinu, ve'al ko Yisrael, ya say shalom, ya say shalom, shalom aleinu, ve'al ko Yisrael. May we all be blessed to see the return of peace in our time. And may we all be blessed to respect each other. Thank you for being so kind to us, saying these very, you know, asking great questions. Hope this helped. Please, if you have a question, go to FOR, not the number, FOR, for United Solutions. Dot org. You will find a lot of the answers and materials. And there's business cards outside. If you have a question, you can always email events at nersimcha.org. It'll get to me eventually. Orlando will forward it to me or whatever. And, and most importantly, please be kind with each other because that's really what it's about. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for being had. Yeah. <laughs>